Hello, I'm Jose Abel, a professor at the Universidad de Los Andes in Chile. And first of all, I want to thank you for inviting me to this symposium. It's a very interesting symposium, which I regret to not be able to be physically there. Uh, I want to talk to you about, about our physics-based uh, methodology to do earthquake soil structure interaction analysis and its applications for the near field induced seismic events in the Netherlands. To start, uh, I want to present my team. Uh, Jorge Krempin is our seismologist. He's a professor at Universidad de Chile. He did his PhD with Ralph Archuleta at UCSB. Uh, Federico Pisano, whom I met at Davis. He's a professor at TU Delft in ocean engineering. Uh, my former advisor, Boris Jeremic, uh, I did my PhD with him at UC Davis. And I'm your speaker, Jose Abel. Uh, I'm going to talk first uh, about how to approach SSI, and there are different levels to do this, and where my method fits. My method is a domain reduction method, uh, which I'm going to explain bri briefly next. Uh, our applications to this method are in the nuclear industry, so I'm going to show a nuclear power plant. And then I'm going to think about how this might be applied to the in induced seismicity events that you have in the Netherlands. Now, our philosophy for soil structure interaction is that you have to do earthquake soil structure interaction. And by that we mean you explicitly model the earthquake uh, source and the propagation into the soil site, and then on top of that you have a structure. Uh, we do think that this is the most rational, comprehensive approach, and I'm going to explain to you why. In modeling of SSI, uh, the first problem that comes is that of how do you incorporate seismic motions into a structural model. You have some structure over, over a semi-infinite medium. How do you put the earthquake into this model? Now, the level zero approach is not to do soil structure interaction at all. In that case, you can attach a non-inertial frame of reference over a rigid boundary uh, or a rigid foundation and apply a seismogram, and that manifests itself as a series of lateral forces on the structure. The next level up is to say that the, the foundation is actually flexible. You put some springs there, linear springs, and you do the same thing. You have the lateral forces uh, from the seismic record. The next step up is to make these springs nonlinear, so they'll have some hysteretic uh, behavior, which is more proper to soil. And that's uh, the next level up is to continue uh, paying attention to the soil, and you actually go and make it a continuum with rigid boundaries. You can make this linear or nonlinear, and the rigid boundaries al allow you to still attach this non-inertial frame of reference, and the way to input the record is basically the same. The next level up, though, is to get rid of the rigid boundaries and apply the earthquake as a plane wave approaching into the, into the site. Now, the most advanced level uh, you have to do this is actually the domain reduction method by uh, Jacobo Bialak in 2003. What this method does, it separates uh, the problem into an interior domain and an exterior domain. The exterior domain includes the source and the propagation of the seismic waves then you analyze separately the interior domain which contains structure and site and you apply the earthquake as a series of equivalent forces at the boundaries. Uh, the computation of these forces is done uh, using the finite elements located at that boundary, their mass and stiffness matrices, and the acceleration and displacements recorded at those nodes. This means that you need to know for each of the nodes in the boundary the acceleration and displacement. And this is not known for for a record, it's not possible to record this information, therefore you de do need to do simulations to get this kind of information. As any method, uh, DRM comes with pros and cons. The pros is that you can do 3D motions exactly as long as you have a good seismic model. Uh, with all its complexities, you can, you can have inclined waves and surface waves, anything you can think of. Therefore, it's the most rational way to input earthquake into the soil structure system. But it also has the added advantage that it takes care of the seismic radiation without further effort. That is, when the structure moves, it's going to induce motions in the soil, and those motions are going to generate damping. This is free in the DRM methodology. The domain can be linear or nonlinear, and it does not increase the computational cost because DRM is just a set of forces. It's nothing uh, extra or fancy that you need to do. On the cons, you cannot use seismic records, although you can do it if you play some tricks. It's not the philosophy behind DRM. <coughs> Therefore, you do need a previous independent seismic simulation to obtain the input earthquake. And there are some storage cuts into storing all those accelerations and displacements. 
in the order of gigabytes for medium-sized problems. Th this is not a big issue nowadays. We have big disks and fast disks. Uh, our applications are in the nuclear industry, so I'm going to show you how we've applied this to nuclear power plants. First of all, we start with the model for the regional crust. Uh, the model we have is has 500 meters per second uh, shear wave velocity at the top and 2500 at the bottom. Inside this 1D structure, we put a uh, point source and we propagate some waves within this domain and at the neighborhood of uh, the nuclear power plant site, we measure, measure motions. Now, depending on the geometry, the sort on the frequency content, you can get waves which look like this, which is pl like planar waves approaching the site. All these motions are fairly similar. Uh, if you alter the geometry, just the geometry, you'll get uh, differences in the particle motion, but it's essentially the same thing. The waves are plane. But if you put 3D effects, or if you go to higher frequencies, or you put some 3D differences in the crustal model, you'll get 3D differences in the motions. And this is our point exactly. You cannot approximate this with a plane wave. Now, our, sort, our model of the structure and the site, it's a generic model that means it's meant to represent a generic nuclear power plant, not, not a particular one. And uh, to start with DRM modeling, what you need to do is you need to separate uh, your site into a DRM layer and an interior site, and you put some extra elements outside to absorb this outgoing radiation. On top of that, you can build your nuclear power plant. Now, uh, this model that I'm showing here consists of about 100,000 nodes, 100,000 elements, and like 500,000 uh, uh, Gauss integration points. Now, if we excite this model to low frequency input, what you see is that for low frequencies, the plane wave assumption shown in blue tends to match the full 3D wave assumption shown in green, both in the time domain as well as in the frequency domain, if you look at the top and the bottom most uh, graphs. The middle one is not a significant one because uh, there's a, s a symmetry about the y uh, plane, xy plane. So, <coughs> If you go to higher frequencies, then the motions tend to be uh, pretty much different. And if you see now in blue, the full 3D approach is uh, much lower than the plane wave assumption for this particular case. And this is also manifested in the Fourier response of the nuclear power plant. And this is uh, across a wide variety of, uh, of structural response measures. We do these types of analysis in parallel. So we solve the nuclear uh, power plant and site model, in this case it, with a just a five domain partition within an, uh, and I solved it on my laptop. But for bigger problems, you do need to go to supercomputers like the Edison cluster. This is the one at, or located at NERSC, uh, which we've been using, especially for the seismic simulations. Now, uh, to some remarks, this type of analysis is warranted. It's gonna depend on the type of structure. You're gonna do it for important structures like nuclear power plant, not so much for houses, which might not warrant this type of analysis. If you have uh, a large scale of structure to site or uh, nearby faults, uh, the 3D effects are going to be more relevant. If you want to uh, evaluate for higher frequencies, the 3D effects are going to be more relevant. In my experience, so far, traditional methods tend to overpredict some of the response measures and not underpredict other ones, which means that you cannot do some uh, general conclusions about SSI. SSI effects have to be evaluated case by case. And the relevance of 3D effects has to be evaluated case by case. Now, as applications to the induced seismicity problem in the Netherlands, uh, what happens is if you, you have gas extraction to the north of the Netherlands, which induced all these are the, the events that have occurred over there. And the mechanism for this is that you have stiff rock overlying softer rock where the gas reservoir is. You do some extraction, which reduces the pressure in this reservoir, which changes the state of stress in the overlying crust, which induces earthquakes. These earthquakes are characterized by uh, steep dip angles uh, in normal faults. They're very superficial, which means you feel them a lot. They have uh, short rupture lengths and low stress drops, less than 20 bar, and correspondingly uh, low magnitudes. Additionally, the regional geology is very well understood due to the gas mining operations, which means this problem is very amenable for 3D modeling because you have you can go to uh, small domains due to the shallow depths and rupture lengths. And the sources are rather simple, so you can delegate the complexities to the moment release function of the point source and the 3D structure. In addition, the low uh, stress drop implies lower frequency content, which just means that you can go for 
longer time steps and, and longer grids, uh, which brings down the computational complexity. Now to the conclusions. Uh, in my opinion, the induced seismicity problem in the Netherlands is very amenable to this type of analysis. This is going to be relevant for your flexible structures as well as long structures, which might see uh, many cycles of wavelengths uh, for the waves involved. Uh, DRM-based ESSI can include all 3D effects as well as propagation effects. Uh, the 3D seismic simulations required are computationally expensive, but as, as I mentioned, this can be reduced for the problem in the Netherlands. And additionally, if you have a 1D crustal structure, then this cost is further brought down. Uh, finally, our approach, we think our approach uh, to SSI is the most rational, comprehensive approach you can have, and it's, uh, it's basically the state of, uh, the, state of the art in, at this moment. And with that, uh, I want to thank you very much for the opportunity. I hope you enjoyed uh, the talk, and I hope if you have any questions, you can forward them to me uh, through Federico. Thank you.